Let's talk about set theory. Set theory is going to give us a mathematical foundation for probability theory. So we need a way of describing the things that we care about, and that is going to be via set theory. So a set is really just a collection of elements. And these elements can be anything that you like, okay? The simplest thing that you might think about when you uh, think about a set is just numbers. So maybe I have A is one, three, and five, so natural numbers. Or I could have real numbers. B is from minus 2.32 to 1.45, and everything in between. But we could be a little more abstract. We could think about words as uh, elements of a set, so win and lose or even animals. So here, let's just draw a cat and a dog, and we could have even, you know, any other thing that you think about. So, you know, more complicated events associated with engineering systems, whatever it is that you want to study. A set can also be empty, and we're going to call that the empty set or the null set. And in purple here, I've introduced some notation for that. That's a zero with a slash through it, that's just going to stand in for the null set whenever we need a symbol. We also have the universal set. That's with this big omega in purple. And that is going to be the set of all elements. As an example, consider a six-sided die. All right. So just a standard die. You roll it. And what could you see? You could see one, two, three, four, five, and six. And the important thing to keep in mind is that the elements in the universal set are for the specific context that you have. So in this six-sided die example, I didn't write down cat and dog as well because the only things that mattered in that context were these six numbers. So it's really only the things that you're going to see in the situation that you're um, concerned about. Okay, so a bit more notation. So let's say X with this epsilon symbol A, that's going to mean X is an element of A. It's a nice shorthand to have. If I draw a slash through that symbol, that's going to mean that X is not an element of A. And there are many ways that I can use to describe a set. So um, maybe let's start with the simplest one. What I could just do is list the elements. So sometimes that's convenient. I could write down A, 3, 4, 5, and so on. And we know that that means I'm going to see 6, 7, 8, 9 going on to infinity. I could also give a rule. So I could describe a rule in words. I could say that the set A are the natural numbers that are larger than two. That means the same thing as three, four, five, and so on. I could also give a mathematical rule. So um, here I would write X um, in the natural numbers, right? So this N is gonna be natural numbers that is greater than two. So this is called set builder notation. The way that it works is I have a variable, in this case X, it's an element of a set. The universal set is, in this case, the natural numbers. There's a such that colon, and there is a condition, in this case, greater than two. And if you parse this, you can just see that it means the same thing as the rule above in words, natural numbers that are larger than two. And each of these description methods is going to be convenient in different contexts, and sometimes we're going to use them in combination with one another. The important thing to keep in mind is that whichever method seems the most obvious or clearest to you, that's the one that you should use. There's no right answer. It's just whatever is the most convenient. Okay, a set A is considered to be a subset of a set B, written as A with this tilted uh, U, B. If all of the elements in A are also elements of B. So as an example, if A is the set 1, 4, and B is the set 1, 2, 3, 4, then A is a subset of B. A and B are equal if they contain each other, and that just means that they have the same elements. By default, we say the null set is a subset of any set, and that any set is a subset of the universal set. We can use Venn diagrams to illustrate relationships between sets to get a better visualization. So here, let's just draw a box. That box represents the universal set. Let's draw the set B as a green oval, and the set A is a red circle inside B. What that means is A is a subset of B, which is a subset of the universal set. Let's continue and think about some set operations. 
So the first one we're going to introduce is the union, written as A with this U symbol B. So that's the union of sets A and B. And it's the set that consists of the elements of the universal set that happen to belong to either A or B or both. So they just have to belong to one of those sets to be part of the union. In set builder notation, I just write X is an element of A or an element of B. The set theory version of this is a logical OR, and as a Venn diagram, we can visualize this, say, as a circle and a square that overlaps in part with this circle. When I take the union, I kind of get this uh, square with a half circle protruding from it, and that represents the combination of the elements. Sometimes we want to write the union of more than one set, so n sets, we want to take their union. We can use this notation with the big U with the subscript i equals 1 going up to n. That means take the union of a1 all the way up to a n, and in set builder notation, those are just the elements of the universal set that belong to a1 or a2 or all the way up to a n. Let's do the same uh, introduction for the intersection. So that's just a intersect b with this backwards u symbol. So the intersection of a and b is the set that consists of the elements of the universal set um, that belong to both A and B. So the way that we write this is A intersect B in set builder notation is A is an element of, X is an element of A and X is also an element of B. The set theory version of this is a logical, this is a set theory version of the logical and, and we can visualize this as just this half circle now. So in this Venn diagram, the only part that is included in both A and B is this purple half circle. So that's the intersection. We also introduce notation um, going from 1 to n for the intersection. So that's just a shorthand for taking the intersection of A1 up to A2 up to An. And in set builder notation, those are the elements that belong to A1 and A2 all the way up to An. Okay, next is the complement. So the complement of A is written as A superscript C. And that is the set that consists of all the elements of the universal set that do not belong to A. Okay, so they're not part of A, then they're in the complement of A. So in set builder notation, those are just the elements that do not belong to A. And this is a set theory version of a logical not operation. All right, and visually, the way to think about this is about A, and I want to take its complement. I need to think about the universal set in order to get the right context. So I need to see that the universal set is this rectangle in order to know that really all the elements that are not in A are the elements in this rectangle that fall outside of A. Otherwise, it's um, a little confusing to think about in terms of Venn diagram. So I need to see the outside of A, the entire universe as well, before I can write the complement. Finally, uh, let's introduce this set difference. A minus B is the notation. And what we're doing here is just taking um, the elements of the universal set that happen to belong to A, and they also do not belong to B. So I'm taking away the elements of A that belong to B. So I'm just looking at the elements that are in A and are not in B. That could also just be A intersected with the complement of B. And visually what that would look like, if I have this circle and this square, the left half circle of A is not included in B, and that's what would be in the set difference. This is sometimes convenient, but really doesn't show up as often as the other three operations. So, you know, if you're going to forget about one of these four, let it be this one. All right, to Morgan's laws, again, you've probably seen this in some other context, but just to refresh, if I want to take the complement of A union B, the complement applies to A and to B, and it also applies to the union and flips it to an intersection. So the condition not in A or B becomes not in A and not in B. For more than two sets, exactly the same thing is going to happen. So I take the complement of the union from A1 up to AN, I get the intersection of A complement from A1 complement up to AN complement. You can also take the complement of the intersection. I get the union of the complements. So not in A and B becomes not in A or not in B. And the same thing if I apply this to more than two sets, I take the complement 
of the intersection from uh, 1 to n, and I get the union of the complements from 1 to n. Okay, um, let's recall the notation for the interval of a real line. So we write this as kind of this r with a double line through it to represent the real numbers. And there are four intervals we're going to introduce. So if I go from a to b with these square brackets, those are the real numbers that sit between a and b inclusive. It's called a closed interval. I could also write a curvy parenthesis on the right, and that means I now don't include b. I have a strict inequality on the right-hand side. I could do the same on the left-hand side, which means I don't include a, but I do include b. These are half open intervals. And finally, I could write curvy parentheses a, b, just to mean that I start from a and I go to b, and I don't include either side, and that is an open interval. Let's work out an example with this notation, as well as the set operations, just to get feel for it. So if I have the universal set as 1 to 5, I can draw this as a line. So on the left-hand side, I'm going to have the element 1, and on the right, I'm going to have the element 5, and in between, I'm going to have all the real numbers and their decimals um, on this line. And I can have the set A, which let's say is 1 to 3, inclusive. So I write that with these square brackets. I could have B, which is uh, an open interval from 2 to 4. I can write this as this curvy parentheses, stretching from 2 all the way to 4. And finally, I'm going to have C as a half open interval, um, starting right after 3 and going all the way to 5. Okay, so now I visualize all those three sets. And let's start by taking the complement um, of A. So if I want to take the complement of A, I notice I can't include any parts of A, so that means I'm going to start um, right after 3, okay, because A includes 3, and I'm going to go all the way to 5. And if I look, that actually is the same thing as C. There's no need to redraw that. We could also look at the um, intersection of A and B. So what is in both A and B? Well, uh, a starts at 1, B starts a little after 2, or right after 2, so we have to start right after 2, and A ends at 3, and um, B ends at 4, so we're just going to end right at 3. So that's going to be the intersection, because it has to be in both A and B. So that's what we end up with. A intersects C is empty, and the reason for that is that C is exactly a complement. They share no elements in common. B union C well, I'm going to look for what's in both B and C. Well, we start at 2, and including C allows us to stretch all the way to 5. And finally, we can look at uh, B complement. So B complement is going to have a part on the left that's going from 1 to 2 inclusive, because B does not include 2. And it's also going to have a part on the right, which is um, starting from... 4 and going to 5. Again, inclusive because b does not include 4. Okay, so that's what this set is going to look like. It's the union of these two closed intervals. Okay, a couple more uh, set concepts to close off. Um, so we're going to say that the sets a and b are disjoint or mutually exclusive if their intersection is empty. So they don't share elements in common. And we say that a collection of sets, so if I have more than two sets, then that's mutually exclusive or disjoint, whichever you prefer, if there is no pair that has um, elements in common. So if I check all of the different pairs and I intersect them, I just keep getting the null set or empty. Visually, what that would look like for, let's say, three sets, um, let's draw a rectangle here and let's draw our three sets. If they're mutually exclusive, then they're not going to overlap at all. That's all it's going to mean. This is mutually exclusive. A1, A2, A3, mutually exclusive. If they're not mutually exclusive, it means that at least one pair overlaps. So in this case, A1 and A2 overlap. So it would say the set or collection A1, A2, A3 is not mutually exclusive. Although A1 and A3 are mutually exclusive, as well as a2 and a3 are mutually exclusive because neither of those pairs overlap, but the whole collection, a1, a2, a3, is not mutually exclusive. Um, we also have this idea that a collection of sets is collectively exhaustive if 
I take all of those sets together and I take their union, I end up covering the whole space or the universal set. So visually what that would look like, let's say I have four sets and I take those sets and I look at what they cover, they end up covering the entire universal set, which is this black rectangle. Okay, so in this case, A1, A2, A3, A4 are collectively exhaustive. Um, in contrast, let's just take three sets. Uh, it could have been four, but let's just say three that don't cover the whole space. So in this case, I have three sets. They don't cover the whole space. They are not collectively exhaustive. And the last concept we're going to introduce is that a collection of sets is a partition if those sets are both mutually exclusive, so no overlaps, and collectively exhaustive, so they cover everything. Visually, what that would look like is I have sets that don't overlap, and when I look at them all put together, they cover all of the space. So in this case, I have A1, A2, and A3, and they don't have to have the same shape. They could be whatever shapes or configurations you like, but they can't overlap, and they have to cover the whole space.